everybody. I'm engineer Rob Brown with the Dawson Creek Mirror. Uh, I'm not acting for Facebook Live here, but that's why we got this lovely Kinder music. Rick here is holding our Facebook Live video. Um, so we're going to get going here in about 10 seconds, but uh, just a, a quick few brief announcements before we get officially going. Uh, we'd like to recognize that we're on Treaty 8 territory before either one of the candidates race each other for saying that. Um, after that, uh, it's just going to be a pretty informal chat here. I mean, we're going to have some sections broken up, but uh, it's mainly about the two candidates and uh, questions from me, questions from some online business, and then questions from each other, and then finally yourself. Uh, the last thing is we have to be out of here at 9.05 at the latest, so they're going to let the dogs out at about 8.58. So we're going to be out of here by 8.45, hopefully. Um, other than that, I'm going to be uh, quite briefly just uh, announcing these two, and then we're going to get into the, the, giving them the floor of the stage to have some... Uh, Introductions, but uh, we're going to start with our challenger, uh, Trenton, Trenton Lars. And Trenton's just going to pick where he wants to sit, either side, and then we'll flip them at the half kind of thing. And uh, Mayor uh, Dale Bumstead, come on up. Thanks, Trenton. Thanks. All right, and all I did was flip a coin before uh, you both arrived, and uh, whoever sat on that side was just going to answer the questions first kind of thing, and we're just going to go back and forth. But then don't worry, because we're going to flip. So according to the agenda here, we start with introductions. So, Trenton, the floor is yours. Just share the mic. Uh, just hit a tap on the back there when it goes blue. Uh, it's yours, and then just uh, hand it back and forth. Thanks. Hello? No. And if it doesn't work, I'll give you mine. Oh, it was on there. Yep. Check, check. Yep. It's okay. Yeah. What run out in here? Just a little bit longer here. Working now? Working now. There you go. Ten. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Trent Mars. I'm running for mayor for the city of Dawson Creek. I've lived in Dawson for four years now. I was in Fort St. John for three years before that, working at the Site C Dam as a, a supervisor for the uh, Campler. Uh, I have a, a wife and two children. My children are uh, four and two. And uh, I'm just really passionate about my community. I'm from a small town originally, Williams Lake, BC. And so I, I know a small town, everybody's connected to each other in some way or another. And I just want to bring the connections back to people. I want people to have a, a say in what goes on in their city again. And I just want everyone to have a voice and be, be a, a part of a community group. Everyone's part of a group and we're all connected to each other somehow. Um, so yeah, uh, I um, followed my mom in politics uh, since the age of five years old. She ran for school trustee a couple times, so I've always been uh, uh, quite involved myself in politics. And uh, I, I just really want to see change happen and get everyone's opinions. And I'd uh, like to hear from all of you in the coming election term. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Trent. Um, first of all, um, uh, I want to recognize uh, Trenton for uh, stepping uh, up and putting his hand up to uh, let him so let his name stand for uh, the mayor of the city of Boston Creek. I think all of us who uh, put our hand up to serve for our community deserve that recognition, that respect of, of volunteering to serve your community, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, Trenton's done that. Um, my name is Dale Bumstead. I'm born and raised in Boston Creek. Uh, this has been our home. Uh, probably our third or fourth generation uh, families, both on my family as well as my uh, wife Laverne's family. Uh, we raised our kids here um, and has been our home for uh, 65 years. I retired in 2010, uh, spent a couple of years at home and then um, wanted to get back involved into the community. Uh, I was pretty active in the community and all our um, time here and raising our family. So uh, I spent uh, 15 years on the board of the Lakeview Credit Union. I chaired the board for 10 years. I was very involved with our kids in their sports, minor hockey, and I was on the executive and coached hockey. I was the district coaching coordinator for BC Amateur Hockey, coaches clinics, et cetera, to help 
Uh, the kids in sport, I was involved in speed skating, our kids were involved in that sport, lacrosse. I served uh, on, as a director on the, on the Chamber of Commerce and um, also spent six years on the board of Northern Health. And so I think it was that community involvement uh, over the course of my life in the community was just giving back to the community. And certainly in the last five years uh, as the mayor have been very fulfilling in terms of trying to serve and trying to make this community a better place. Um, for me, the mantra is always about quality of life and, and it's clear to me that's what we try to do. We want to build a community with a great quality of life and that is defined by me around health and happiness. Um, and from there, we build three pillars of economic opportunities, strong health care system, strong education system that are provided by the province and we coll work collaboratively with the province. Um, on those initiatives. They come in and do social programs. And then we as a community build those, that infrastructure. First of all, core infrastructure, water, sewer, safety, public safety, police, fire, building inspection. And it's the amenities around quality of life that you take on around arts, culture, recreation, uh, transportation, public works, airports, transit. Those are the components that really are build a community with a great quality of life. I'm so proud of Dawson Creek because sometimes it's easy to take things for granted when you live in a community. You don't appreciate some of those qualities that you have in a community that are really uh, make you a great community. And in 2014, City's Journal and National Magazine uh, rated communities across the country with populations under 100,000 people on their quality of life. And in 2014, Dawson Creek was the number one small city in Canada for its quality of life. And I think that's a testament to the people in our community because that's what it is. It is people. It's not a piece of paper in somebody's desk drawer. So for the last five years, like I say, I've been uh, thoroughly enjoyed this role as uh, representing this community in every aspect of it. I think the thing that I've, I've got probably the most satisfaction out of is reconnecting with the community. I traveled for 12 years with my role. Uh, I was away a lot. And now to be back home and back in the community, working uh, with the community has been really fulfilling and I really appreciate the support that I've had from the community and I really look forward to the opportunity to do this for four more years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say too, I'm on the, on the phone here. It's not because I'm on the internet. I've got my stopwatch going so I'm making sure they don't go over any of the time limits that we have set for the, uh, any of the sessions or questions here. Um, but now, yeah, I mean, Dale, you and I have had a chat in your office before. It's going to be no different than that kind of thing for at least the first half. Um, uh, there's more people here, that's all. Um, and then some of you want to take a job. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, what, what are, and, and you touched on some of it as, uh, as broader scope, but what are some of the specific issues right now as far as the top three or four that are facing the city? And, and that's broad as far as what you could answer, but what are specific um, you know, issues that uh, you think have to be addressed and, and where could they be going in, 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 over the next term? Sure, obviously always the, uh, one of the key priorities for us, the strategic priority that this council set and we continue to develop and deal with is the fiscal uh, situation, the financial uh, responsibility and that's a big deal for all of us. It's that um, financial uh, accountability that we carry and the role we provide as uh, uh, governance and policy board and so they, this, the demands, the inflationary pressures that are put on any business, any community are the same. You've, you have costs increase as a result of operational issues. We're a big organization. Uh, we're not immune from increases in fuel costs, uh, electricity costs, gas costs, insurance costs and all of those rising inflationary pressures on your budgets affect the services you provide. So that's a big one to me in terms of how we uh, deal with that. The other one is always building core infrastructure in terms of ensuring that we've got the capacity to uh, build a community with strong infrastructure, water, sewer, police, and fire. And then finally, I think public safety is one that obviously is a concern because we're going to face some economic opportunities that are going to put pressure on us. And you always want to be in that light. So. Uh, and in the same breath, uh, Trenton, you mentioned some business. Uh, there has to be reasons that you're running. Uh, why are you running specifically? And again, that could be any topic under the city, but why specifically, uh, regardless of, of Dale Bumstead or, or who the mayor is, what, what, what got you to put your name uh, you know, on the line and, and why are you here today? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, what, what initially uh, made me run is I saw nobody was going up against uh, Dale here, 
and I figured that everybody should have a say and uh, hear people's visions for their community and what they want their community to be. And that's one of the things I wanted to do. I wanted to make sure everyone's vision got heard, including everyone in the communities, you know. Uh, we wouldn't be up here if it weren't for the people here today. Um, uh, another thing was, is uh, I, I'm, I'm tired of not, I feel like since I've moved here, I haven't had a voice in the, the community, you know. I, uh, I, I work a job out of town most of the time, and to attend a council meeting at nine in the morning, I'd have to take a whole day off work. Sure, I could say I'm, see it online, or write a letter, or do what I need, uh, and still get the message out there, but I'm not getting the initial response then. And I just want more public awareness and, and public say to be brought back to everybody here. Okay, and how do you think the, uh, the industry and, and small business and, and non-profits, those are the three-part question, how do you think the relationship is with the city of Dawson Creek? I, I and I don't mean in the lowercase city of Dawson Creek, I mean with the municipal uppercase city of Dawson Creek. Uh, honestly, I think there's uh, always room for more improvements with anything for matter, but there's always room for uh, more, more error as well. I've uh, been around with some of the local businesses in the downtown core here, and they're, I've, they've told, expressed to me that I'm the first person who's came in and talked to them and found out their concerns in, in the uh, four years. Uh, so I feel like it could be improved when you talk about the nonprofits. I feel like uh, uh, we as the city could uh, put more effort in to really get the word out there for people. Uh, for example, I just went to this Take Back the Night event not too long ago, and I didn't really hear much word other than something I saw in the news that evening uh, that just happened to show up on my news feed. Uh, they had the reptile thing at the mall last week, and there was a... a an advertisement for this reptile display for a month, and we need to be doing more We're stuff like that. that. Okay, just following up though, uh, not to take into Dale's time here, because uh, just uh, I want uh, just to expand uh, twofold to follow up on when you said you mentioned you talked to businesses and nonprofits. What businesses, uh, not what businesses, I don't care about what businesses, but what concerns are business owners uh, hitting you with when you go walking into the door? Uh, a lot of their concerns are uh, uh, current infrastructure. Uh, one of them can, uh, came to the concern to me and actually took me outside and showed me how much of a, a tripping hazard their sidewalk was and how much of a safety hazard it was for the general public. Um, the, the other one, uh, another good example was uh, uh, the beautification of the city. And I'm all for city beautification, but somebody told me that there was people watering flowers at 5 a.m. during the rain uh, in, in downtown court. Uh, and that's, that's a big issue to me uh, when people are, are complaining about that and they're saying we want less. Okay, and, and, and uh, just following up, uh, just a two-part follow-up, and we're going to give Mike Dales. Uh, you mentioned a few things, uh, Take Back the Night and a few other events. How is that in any uh, way, uh, other than, hey, just spread the word because, hey, you know, it's nice to spread the word. How is that in any way a responsibility of a municipality? I don't think it's a, a direct uh, responsibility, but I think those uh, nonprofits just feel like they aren't getting any support for uh, awareness more so. Um, uh, the, the city's not uh, working to make people more uh, aware about these events that are going on and partaking. I think, you know, I think it'd just take a little bit to make some more awareness. I was talking with somebody and they told me that you could get a city, uh, uh, city planner with all the events at this, this, this location. As they're listing the locations, I'm thinking, well, that's all places that, you know, I'd go if I was just passing through town and wanted to find out some of Fair the enough. history. Okay. Uh, Dale, back to the original question, and then we'll get into some follow-ups. Uh, industry, small business, and nonprofits. How, how's the relationship from the mayor's chair? So, so first of all, um, as a community, the economic opportunities that are created in your community are created. Uh, in my view, industry comes in and creates and develops the opportunities to support your small business. And your small business are what build your community. And so for us to work collaboratively with the diverse uh, economic opportunities that are, uh, and industries that are, exist in our community, both the forestry sector with LP, with, uh, Louis, or with uh, the natural gas sector, with the agriculture sector, and with the mining sector, are all opportunities that cre are created to enhance the, the support of our local business community. And that, to me, is the, is the focus that we have to have in building that small business network and ensure that industry support our small businesses because it does us no good if they come in, develop the industry, and not support our local businesses. So when they want and look for our support, 
uh, we need to get their support back in uh, hiring our local businesses. As far as the, um, the uh, non-profits, honestly, uh, for us, the non-profits are those organizations that are out there providing services that meet the needs of certain uh, groups within your community. And we all uh, are involved in those and support them and work them. South Peace, the uh, South Peace Historical Society is an example of that, of a non-profit organization providing a service for our community on behalf of our community the city wouldn't provide. And just because we're having a chat here, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, some specific issues there uh, that are, I guess, that would clearly be, you know, uh, city issues, but not, not so much the schedule or the attendance of, of take back the night, but uh, watering at night, uh, you know, I mean, I must have been, I've seen it, he's not talking about, say, uh, sprinklers that are on a system, but people that are going out in the middle of the rain and doing the same thing. I guess, what do you have to say to that in 30 seconds? So, your scheduling of your services for your operations are done on a schedule. And you can't schedule it sometimes and say, well, okay, you don't have to show up at 5 o'clock in the morning to water the plants if it's raining. You schedule the employees to do the work. And unfortunately, sometimes there can be a conflict in that. The council, the mayor and council, don't deal with operations. We set the policy for the city in terms of the services we're going to provide. Beautification is an important issue that we provide in the community to provide a community with a great quality of life. Nice. And we get a lot of feedback from people about how they enjoy seeing that uh, beautification. So we see it as a ballot. Perfect. Trenton, uh, how do you think the downtown core is doing uh, business-wise? Um, and, you know, and, and just community. Uh, Tourism-wise, obviously, we have uh, people that are coming here you know, you know, they're attracted beyond what we do because of the fact that we're at Mile Zero. But uh, specifically downtown, how, how's the business core? Uh, and uh, cite some examples. Uh, I think... Uh, good, uh, good or bad. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, well, the businesses that we have in place now, uh, I think they're doing fine. But I think we need to find a track to, way to bring uh, more uh, new businesses in and to uh, continue to support our, our local businesses once those new businesses come in. Um, I, I have a vision that Dawson Creek will be sustainable, and right now at, at current, I don't see it as being sustainable. I have to travel to Grand Prairie to get something that I can't get here, or Fort St. John, or vice versa. So I'd like to figure out some sort of uh, initiatives that we could use to uh, uh, bring more local business in the town. I mean, with LNG coming, that's going to be a big push. I see by where the SPCA is. Uh, there's roads that are still dirt roads back there, and most of the buildings are for sale. That's prime area for development of new business to come into town if we pave the roads back there. Uh, another example is uh, on the road to the recycling depot, DC Recycling in town here. That road hasn't been updated in years, and now we have uh, uh, city recycling vehicles going over there that's just causing damage on them. Yep. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, downtown uh, core. How, how's the business? How's the? Uh, no, obviously the tourism is always great as long as the weather is uh, great. But how's the? How's the downtown core and uh, things to improve or, or things that are, are thriving? Can you set some examples? Yeah. So, you, so it's kind of surprising, I think, if you looked at our downtown core and you see um, what you would would believe to be vacant without any services. And in fact, uh, there are very few uh, vacant uh, retail locations downtown. The um, struggle is for a community our size, it's uh, Trenton indicates where you're this close to Grand Prairie, the retail services, um, we struggle trying to attract small business uh, retail services because we are so close to the city of Grand Prairie. Now, on that front, when we talk about the growth of our community, they say industry brings in opportunities, they bring the commercial, and once that develops, you bring and raises your population. And once we see that rise in population from different segments, then the retail is the final piece to it. So we're looking at different opportunities in the downtown core. Part of it is policies that we uh, drive to try to enhance and uh, build additional services downtown. Um, but right now, there are no vacancies in the downtown core. Ten seconds. And I think that's a very positive for us that we do have uh, the availability of uh, uh, land downtown to be developed. So. Excellent. Um, Trenton, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> into some tougher stuff. I mean, it, it's been said by a handful of current councillors on the record uh, during, uh, not uh, not just election, but, uh, you know, at, at, at certain times during the year when uh, major expenditures are going through, and then, of course, at budget time. But they say that D.C. must mind its fiscal gap, and, and 
and, and certainly a handful of councillors have sounded off on the record uh, that uh, Dawson's not doing it very well. Uh, and one current councillor pegs the uh, city's building up keep bill into the millions as far as what they uh, you know could be throwing at the at the buildings right now. And, and I'm you know I'm talking about existing infrastructure. You know what do you think city council has done? How do they rectify that? And where does the city go from there? Uh, I, I think uh, everything's about moving forward from this date and the election on. It'll all be about uh, moving forward to uh, enhance our community better. And I think the best way to do uh, take care of it and uh, is to continue to uh, take care of our existing uh, infrastructure. We uh, had a lot of closures in the last few years. Uh, Rotary Lake, uh, Sudeten Hall, and the exhibition grounds are all a few examples of them. And uh, all, it, all it takes is regular maintenance, right, uh, to maintain these buildings and make sure they're good. You can't tell me that they were left for that long without somebody looking that somebody couldn't have brought it up to the attention that, hey, we, we might want to look into doing some, uh, putting some more money into this to do the repairs rather than having it be shut down. I think the, the thing to look for in the future is, is lean away from just leaving our buildings in the in the dusk and just uh, taking care of them while they're around. Uh, pass hand over, uh, Dale. He, I mean, he's mentioned some things that are not uh, certainly not, not any conversation I've had that I consider city infrastructure. Uh, but you know, when uh, you know current councils do say fiscal gap and 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 the, the city isn't minding it and they're the current councillors and you're the current mayor. Where do you go to move forward, and, and why is that? Sure. So, so a community, any community, has what we call a tangible capital asset program. The city of Dawson Creek has about two hundred twenty million dollars in capital assets, and so the capital asset program is one that you manage to ensure that any pro any facilities, any infrastructure that you have today, your roads, your sidewalks, your water, your sewer, your buildings, your facilities, all have a program in place that if and when they reach their end of life, that you have the financial capacity to look after them. And so the fiscal gap for us is defined by, do we have the financial capacity in the future to be able to meet the needs of continuing to provide the financial capacity to look after those that infrastructure in the future when they're deteriorated and need to be replaced? And so under our current structure of our operating budget, taxation, other revenues, piece of our agreement, that delta, that gap is growing in terms of how we're going to be able to manage that. And so that's the that's fiscal nice. gap uh, discussion that we have to have. We have a tangible capital asset. We have a capital asset program in our budget. So every year we allocate a certain amount of money for paving. Two or three million dollars a year goes to paving, right. sidewalks, and other infrastructure. And that's the budgeting process you go through when you're managing your assets. Uh, and, and this is a follow-up uh, to you. It was one of the ones online, and uh, you know, and some of these are, are for you because he can't answer them. You know, and some, you know, we're all against crime, so nobody's you know running on the pro crime ticket. But you know, uh, it came up at the library uh, wheelchair access. Um, obviously, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I can speak for Trent and Sam. I'm sure, he's for having wheelchair access at the library, but obviously, somebody's uh, mentioned that it's been brought up uh, a few times, time and time again. What's the situation there? Yeah, so the library is a uh, program on operational cost to the city. We pay about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a year into the operations of the library. Um, it's operated by a library board who manage that facility and operating it, and the capital uh, uh, improvements that are done to it through their board. The aspect of providing wheelchair access or uh, elevator access to that building is a uh, uh, an issue that just is so expensive to address, it never has been so far. And I don't even know that um, physically it's possible it's like to put a, uh, an elevator into the facility. Okay. Um, here we go, uh, Rotary Lake Trenton. Uh, this is gonna be a, the, a multiple part question, so we'll let you go time over here, um, as long as we're not repetitive. Do you want Rotary Lake open? Uh, why or why not? Uh, if so, please provide a list of steps that should be taken by the city or that the city could recommend to operators, and in what form, if it should reopen at all? Uh, yeah, I'd like to see uh, the lake get reopened, uh, 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 considering the public safety, uh, of course. You know, public safety should always be a number one priority for uh, any mayor or councillor or anyone like that. You know, we should always be looking out for the, the public. And uh, I think the health board uh, 
they, they sent a, a bunch of really good suggestions to, to make it a lake again. And I mean, if that's what it takes to get it reopened, to uh, be an outdoor pool instead of a lake, then that's what it takes, right? As long as there's something for our youth to do in the community again and uh, be active. You know, right now there's not a lot of uh, uh, stuff for our youth to do in the community. And being from a small town myself, that was always an issue in my community when it even came to crime and everything like that for you. So I, I'd like to definitely uh, see it be reopened either way. And uh, any specific steps on, uh, on, on you know, what they could do? I mean, there's a hole in the lake. What, what, they should, what could they do, in, in your opinion, regardless of cost? Yeah, I, I just think uh, whatever would make it safe, safer, right? So the health board, they laid out these uh, uh, ideas and suggestions to make it safer. And I think we should really be working along with them and making safety a, a top priority. I think we should be taking the steps in order to ensure that we aren't going to have any more accidents there in the future. Fair enough. Dale, uh, same, do you want me to repeat the... The run here? No, okay. good. Okay. So the uh, aspects of Rotary Lake are that it is designated as a lake, and it's a, designated as a lake because it was built in the 60s or 50s by the service groups in our community. And after, um, in the, I'm going to say in the 70s, the provincial government in, implemented pool regulations. And those pool regulations mean that anybody that opens up or operates a public facility for swimming or outdoor activities uh, as a pool or a lake has to meet the pool regulations. Because our uh, Rotary Lake was built prior to that, some of the aspects around the infrastructure, the water quality, the pumping, and uh, lifeguards, uh, et cetera, and fencing, all of that, are not, we're not required to meet those under that pool regulation because it still falls as a lake uh, under the uh, guidelines. So as we're, when we, obviously, the tragedy that occurred in that lake in 2016, Northern Health, under the public health officer, closed the lake with an order, a health hazard order, and said this lake cannot reopen until you address these infrastructure issues as it relates to uh, the water quality, pumping, fencing, and then you have to have a pool safety plan put in place in order to address lifeguards and all of the other issues. And so for us, we're appealing that order from the provincial government to the Ministry of Health through Northern Health, through the public health officer, to say if we're going to be required to do that, the order wasn't guidelines they gave us, it was an order. And they said, you need to do this, 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 and this to, to address the health hazards that have been identified. 15. And when you deal with those and you bring them back to us, We'll let you know if that reduces the health hazards and we lift the order. So we could have spent five or six or seven hundred thousand dollars in capital mm -hmm. dealing with those uh, infrastructure issues and, and yet still we wouldn't have got the order. And so now we're in that position where we're supporting the Rotary Club who have written a letter to the Ministry of Health saying please uh, let us reopen this lake and we're awaiting the response from them. Thank you. Uh, just coming up today, uh, kind of a Timely story, uh, Poos, uh, Poos Koopi, the village of Poos, uh, Poos there, the municipality, uh, made a donation to the, the Dawson Creek uh, Secondary School for Athletics, and I'm not going to get into the, the, the details of the donation, but it's something that, uh, again, and, or the detail, I don't want to get into the details of this either, but it's uh, something that the, the city of Dawson uh, decided not to support, but spilling out of that is uh, Councilor Rogers suggesting that there's a $25,000 no strings attached from that uh, if the city wants to give some money to any group, they're welcome to do it. And then when they decide to add strings to it, such as the case here, they decide not to. Uh, Trent first and then, and then Dale, uh, what do you think about that? Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I wouldn't say that there's a whole bunch of money uh, put aside just to give to nonprofits, sure, be it nice in the perfect world, but I wouldn't say that that's how it is now. That's something I'd have to look forward to. But I think, you know, if we have the resources and if it's there, then we should be helping uh, uh, these groups out as much as uh, we possibly can, uh, uh, give them the real community spirit, you know. Uh, they create a lot of activities for all sorts. They do a lot of things for the community. They really, they, they really bring the community together. And so if, they, if the city does have the extra money to, to donate to these uh, groups, then I think it should be done. Thank you. Dale. 
So the um, request came to City Council, uh, I'm going to say this summer, I believe, or uh, earlier this year, for $10,000 from the Dawson Creek Secondary School under our grants policy. We have 25, or under our grants budget, we have $25,000 in that budget this year. We've allocated about 14000 so there was about 11000 left. The request came that we would uh, give them $10,000, which would have depleted whatever money we had left in the grant budget for the rest of the year. And it was a request to, for three a commitment to three years of funding. And so two things we don't, uh, we're working on, and we've directed the administration to bring back a policy of how we'll administer that grant uh, budget. And two, the feeling of council was uh, that the majority who voted against it was one, we want to get that policy done first before we do it, and for others saying we don't want to deplete that entire amount of $10,000 now and not have anything left, and others uh, were opposed to uh, committing over three years. Thank you. Well, we're at, we're at the half now. Uh, if uh, we're good, if you guys want to get up and stretch or take a 10 second break, don't you want to move? Okay, uh, we'll keep on rolling then, uh, and then we're going to start now. I'm just going to remember uh, Dale kind of gets the first ad to crack at the answers, so that'll be easy. Uh, Trent, do you have any questions, or do you have a, first, do you have one question for the mayor? A little bit of actual debate here, if you will. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, so my first question is, uh, uh, what have you done to bring new business into the city of Dawson Creek while also supporting our current business? Yeah, so I took a really aggressive approach when I was first elected to try to get uh, an established Dawson Creek uh, in uh, the energy sector. because. For years and years and years, our community has been bypassed. It was serviced either out of Grand Prairie or Fort St. John. And so I took a real deliberate effort to engage with the oil and gas industry in Calgary. I made trip after trip down there, introduced myself to every industry that was operating in northeastern British Columbia, specifically in the South Peace, started to build the relationship with them, and then started to organize events because as I had built and started to build a strong relationship with them... 15, um, 15 seconds then um, I wanted to find a way to build that relationship and connection with them to our business community. So I organized what I called the Mayor's Roundtable, invited the industry uh, leaders, senior people from Calgary here, and organized an event with our business community and built that connection with them. One other initiative last year we did, we promoted a video with TransCanada. They were building a major pipeline project into Dawson Creek. I pitched the idea to them of we do a promotional video promoting our local businesses with them, and that they would then be able to use that in demonstrating how effectively it can work when they work with a community. We built a promotional video for four minutes with them, and that was a way for us to build that connection with industry to, in order to support our local business. Great. Any questions for, any questions for Trent? Uh, no, I know. Uh, honestly, I'm, um, I don't know Trenton, and, uh, and so it's difficult for me to uh, ask yeah. him. Other than, I'm just, I'm just honestly, I'm, uh, I'm so pleased to see somebody has put up their hand to serve our community and that there's an opportunity for people to vote. And that's what it should be. So I give him credit for putting his hand up to serve our community. Anything else? Uh, any more uh, for Dale? We're not going to let you, uh, you know, land blow after blow here. But uh, <laughs> uh, sir, had, since I, he says he's not going to throw any back, but uh, if, you, if you got any more, uh, uh, yeah, I, got, I got one more good yep. one. Uh, um, my, my last question for you. Uh, many people in the community have approached me expressing crime issues, especially in newly built neighborhoods. What are your plans to improve safety and lower crime? Yeah, you know, public safety is a huge issue for us, and uh, we just recently just went through the process of hiring a new staff sergeant. I took the initiative in that process to engage in the interview process and the selection process of the new leader of our detachment. Uh, I wanted to ensure that we were involved in that process from the city. On funding for RCMP, you get an allocation of members based on the crime statistics of a community. And so depending on the size of your community, it depends on how much it costs you. So if you're a community under 5,000 people, you don't pay for policing. Community of 5,000 to 15,000 people pays 70% of the cost of policing. And if you're over 15,000, you pay 90% of the policing. So the allocation of the number of members we get for our community is based on crime stats. And then because we have rural detachment, uh, rural uh, members as well, that goes into our complement as well. And so one of the things for us that we're really uh, keen about now, having our new staff sergeant in place, is building a strategic policing plan, identifying those key priorities that we see are uh, key initiatives uh, that we can help ensure public safety is such a big component for all of us in a community. Ten seconds. Oh. 
Uh, great, then. Okay, uh, one last question, and then we'll uh, throw it to the audience to see if they have anything to ask uh, anybody. You've got a million dollars uh, for any uh, Dawson Creek department um, or, or, or project um, or area, no strings attached. What's your choice? Where does the money go and why? Dale, your answer first. You know, one of the initiatives that I've uh, really Am I on? Not only it's working here. You, you, you do this one, I'll turn that one on. Trade you. Yeah. One of the initiatives that I really felt was important uh, when I did get elected, when I talked about health and happiness, was health care. And identifying that a strong health care system in a community is critical. Uh, that's built on a foundation of acute care. We need to have a great hospital. We need to have physicians. And we need to have acute care services. The primary care services that you go and get from your family doctor are built on a foundation of a strong acute care system. There are things that go on within Northern Health that they can do and cannot do. But we spearheaded, and I spearheaded, an initiative to form a health, South Peace Health Society. And it's a society made up of Tumble Ridge, Chetland, Puskupi, Dawson Creek, and our rural areas. And what we're working on is collaboratively, proactively working on initiatives that we can help build health care services in our community. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to buy some short-term accommodation. So that when we have locums come in, when we have agency nurses come in, that we have a place for them to stay that's reasonably priced. We got $75,000 a year from the Peace River Regional District now for that funding. If I had a million dollars, I'd plug it right into that society and help us build a really strong health care system. Because I'm worried like crazy about that acute care services. And when we build that new hospital, we need to ensure that we have solid acute care services for our community and our region. Perfect. Trenton, same thing. You got a million bucks. What, where's it going with the city? Oh, that's not a lot of money. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, I like to kind of, in a way, expand on his. Uh, my big thing that a lot of people have been coming to me, telling me that they want in their community, is uh, uh, seniors' uh, rehabilitation housing in this town. So that way, you know, when somebody falls, breaks a leg, has a stroke, they have this rehabilitation program where they can uh, uh, see a physiotherapist or whatever they need to every day, and that person helps them recover until they can get back to their own homes. Uh, another big thing, though, for me would be uh, public safety for everyone, you know, uh, going back to the crime thing. I, I really think there's more that we could be uh, doing uh, to improve on crime and uh, to, or to lower it, sorry. And uh, I think that's what I'd spend a million dollars on is to make a, an acute center and uh, to lower crime. Okay, uh, we're gonna, uh, not going to get into any, any outro yet for uh, YouTube, but uh, if you guys want to share the mic, I'll go into the audience and see if anybody's brave enough to have a chat uh, with you guys. Um, as far as uh, anybody in the audience, just kind of, I get you have to set up the question, but don't uh, pull the stand too much. Hit them with a the question, keep it under a minute, and then uh, if you guys can keep it under a minute to the answers, and uh, we'll see who has anything to say. I'll run up to anybody, anybody got any hands? I can just kick you in the order I see you kind of thing. Perfect, okay. Work away from the top down. taken the initiative over the last six months. We've engaged in some public hearings and gained uh, survey uh, responses from the community about this topic. So there's four components for us about the legalization that we needed to be concerned with. First one was the dispensaries, where you're going to allow dispensaries, which areas, how you're going to allow them to operate and in which locations. Um, second was the public consumption of marijuana and how you're going to uh, monitor that. The other was uh, the private... Um, 
production of marijuana within uh, your own residence, and then the other is public uh, growing of uh, marijuana and uh, agricultural land. So we've set the bylaw now in place in terms of where you can establish dispensaries. We put a 150 meter uh, buffer zone around um, schools, playgrounds, and things like that. Um, and so we are now uh, going to be allowing the, uh, as soon as the legislation makes it legal, that you can then apply for a business license for uh, a dispensary in the community. The only issue we're really concerned about, and we put a, a, a license fee a little bit higher on them, is because we think that this public consumption is allowed in the province and federally, and so we're not going to restrict it by other than within our smoking bylaw. And so we think that there'll be some public pushback to our bylaw enforcement officers. It's going to add some work to them. We don't know what that's going to mean and what it's going to be like. And so we want to make sure that that bylaw, that business license, allows us to recoup some of those additional costs that now are going to be downloaded by the province and the federal government on us. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to the uh, uh, business license aspect of things, I think like uh, any business, uh, you still gotta you gotta do your background checks and uh, really look into uh, uh, the business plan and the model that they want to achieve with it. Um, you know, the thing with marijuana marijuana legalization coming, uh, the big thing I find with it is the the people who smoke it. You know, I've been smoking it anyway for the last ten years, and the people who are, are going to start, they're going to try it, you know, a couple times type thing. It'll be uh, more easily accessible, and uh, I like that we have a, a medical clinic here finally. But yeah, I think it's just really doing the background checks uh, into these people who want to obtain a business license for it, and uh, really following through with inspections on those businesses. And just to ask that, then, um, how do you think this will affect the Dawson Creek's economy? Uh, I, I think uh, I think it'll actually uh, add to the economy. I think it, it's a, a new uh, sector in general, and uh, if we could bring the businesses in the Dawson Creek, uh, I think we, we could really uh, uh, boom off on it. And I think that uh, Dawson Creek will see a lot of good things from it. Do you want to yeah. That one? yeah, I think the city council has taken the approach that listen, this is going to be legal on October 17th and we want to make sure that we guide the development of our community in terms of where we're going to allow the dispensaries to be situated. We want to make sure that smoking bylaw, public consumption, we keep it away from playgrounds and parks and things like that for where children are present. But we're certainly not putting anything in place that would try to restrict or make it more cumbersome for it. And so it's hard to know what it's going to do for the economy. You've got to apply to the provincial government for your first license piece of it to meet that qualification. That's $7,500 so I, I think it's going to be something that's going to be, there's going to be a ton of interest in it. We've already seen that. It'll just be uh, for us to see how and where they get their dispensary set up and how saturated that becomes in the community and whether then the business model is viable for them or not. Thank you. Thanks. May I actually, sorry, sure. can, I, can I add something? Sure, yeah. So I, okay, can you hear me? Sorry, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so I heard that you said about the dispensaries, how about like just a regular business, let's say like a gas station, if they want to apply for a business uh, license for that, are they, are you going to be allowing them or no? No, you got to, so you're going to have the requirements, uh, first of all, provincially to, yeah. to get a license. And then for us in the city, we want to make sure we establish that buffer zones yeah. for the dispensaries and the number and where they're located. So let's say if the certain place, sorry, I'm not trying to cut you off, but let's say if that certain place is away from that buffer zone, they will be allowed? As long as it fits within the zoning that's allowed for them, then yeah, they're going to they're gonna be completely illegal as long as they meet within that zoning uh, criteria. Okay. Right. We a couple questions here. That's a couple hands if you want. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I think uh, both of you have made a lot of great points. I think you're both in agreement that you want to address the fiscal gap. You want to beautify the city. You want to have common sense uh, labor like you were Trenton was mentioning the uh, watering the, the flowers and the rain. But I think uh, the elephant in the room is, if anyone looks at the budget, labor in almost every single department of the city is the number one expense. So I think the, the real question should be, how do you beautify the city at the same time, utilize the non, and you're also part of the nonprofits and the businesses too. So I think nobody really addressed it, but the number one expense is labor then, and you support nonprofits and businesses, I think, my, I'm kind of making a statement, but 
no one really addressed how you're going to reduce the expenses of the city. And in, just in my, I'm a layman, the labor is the number one expense. So the question in, that I'm asking is, it's not what time should you be watering the flowers, it's how do we get to the flowers watered without costing the taxpayers any money? And that's my question. How do you get the flowers watered without costing taxpayers any money? So you, you set a, a policy within your administration to say, listen, part of our beautification, part of our parks, part of our community beautification is we're going to put $25,000 into purchasing uh, hanging baskets for the downtown core. And then you have to manage that on your own. You can't rely on somebody else to look after them and because uh, eventually that falls apart and then they uh, are not looked after and um, uh, maintained properly. So to me, the policy is if you're saying it's costing us too much, that we can't afford it, then you remove that service. The issue with labor in a, in a, in a community when you're providing services, it's very, very difficult to say, we're going to cut the hours at the arena so that we can reduce the costs and reduce the labor costs. Sometimes what that means is you're at a minimum level of service as it is. It means you close the arena or it means you close the curling arena. And so that's the difficult part about when you minimize the labor costs, um, then you can impact services in a significant way. The, the major costs for the city uh, are really in some of those other services. Four and a half million dollars for uh, policing. Three and a half million for fire protection. There's seven or eight million dollars that comes out of our uh, budget just out of a seventeen and a half million in taxation we collect from property owners and business owners. Seven and a half right. or eight million go to public safety alone. So there's some big nuts in there in terms of stuff that you pay for, and the difficulty in terms of cutting just a bit of labor, you're cutting an entire service. In. That's the dilemma you have when you're providing services. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I like that question. Uh, with the flower thing, actually, I've spoken to all the of business owners in the core here, and they've actually said that they uh, would rather have one basket than two hanging baskets currently, so that would reduce some costs. Uh, and the other thing, I don't think it's about uh, cutting programs, per se, but I think it's uh, more of uh, juggling uh, the staff around, right? Like, I go to work, and... If I'm not painting that day, they send me to go do a demolition type thing. And it's just uh, using our city workers and our resources uh, in, in more of a variety of ways, you know, uh, cross-training them and uh, just using them any way possible, you know. Uh, the city workers are really uh, the backbone uh, to any city, you know. A city couldn't function or, or be managed without them supporting us. And so I think the big thing is, is being able to utilize them in more ways just for one, other than one purpose. All right, great. Um, so reading Facebook, and I, and I think uh, there's no denying that we all have a passion for the, for the recent LNG announcement and what that's going to mean to our communities, um, our economy, um, our potential for growth. Um, but I, I was uh, I was quite taken with a, a couple of comments, Dale, on a post of yours just uh, the other day from a couple of ladies talking about this LNG explosion and the, and the gold rush and how do we go about managing that and maintaining our, our community? How do we uh, go about with responsible resource development and maintaining the charm and uniqueness of our community? Um, and not allowing us to, to rampage through our community. So, um, you know, in February, March, um, it became evident to me traveling up the highway when you saw the, the, the build of those large plants up at mile 25 and you see the amount of activity with, that was in there. And so, uh, as part of this uh, initiative I've taken on by building this relationship with our South Peace mayors and rural directors. We organized a trip to Victoria. We met with the Minister of Energy. We met with the Minister of Highways. We met with the Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resources. And we talked about four or five really key issues for us. And we identified to the Minister of Energy at that time that, listen, the cumulative impacts that are affecting the rural residents in our region are now starting to be significant. Nobody, I don't think ever, would have anticipated the hyperactivity that was occurring in Farmington. 
And so we led that discussion with the Minister of Energy about exactly that topic and saying, look, you've got all these metrics in place in terms of how you measure what the activity are and number of wells and all that, but there's nothing measuring the social impact to the residents. And we need to find a way to put an oversight committee in place to ensure that that structure uh, by those communities in Farmington and Go River and uh, uh, Ground Birch and Eris, who are impacted by the industry, have the ability to feed that information up to the, or the Oil and Gas Commission, as well as to the Minister of Energy, ensuring that they have their voice heard, understanding transparency of information. What's happening? How long is it going to be here? What are the future plans? Yeah. How many rigs? And so from that discussion, the Deputy Minister of Energy has now met with the Peace River Regional District on four separate occasions with the chair, the president of the Oil and Gas Commission, and they have set up exactly that. They've set up an oversight committee so that the rural residents right. who are impacted by this have an opportunity to get that information fed up and transfer transparency of information. That we led them. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. I think uh, with LNG coming, the example you used there, uh, Dawson Creek's going to have a, a lot of workers coming in, and there's going to be a, a big boom for sure that, that would change any community, even the largest communities. And, and I think we really just have to remember who our, our local people is, are and really communicate with them and make sure that they're getting the needs that they deserve and that it's not just being handed to uh, some people for a job type thing, right? I mean, job growth is important. And I'd really like to see, you know, uh, a, a way uh, to create local job growth with LNG and just to keep, to try and keep as many locals as possible uh, with, with that yeah. being so close to Dawson. And I think if uh, we could do that and just work all together as a community and have that community spirit, I think uh, we'll be able to overcome the, the giant changes that you speak of. I have a question here from the audience. Uh, keep, uh, keep Mike Trent, we'll go with you first. Uh, do you believe the bylaw regarding cats no longer being allowed to roam off their owner's property has helped or hindered pet owners? Why do you think this? Do you believe that the general population is happy with the new cat bylaw? Uh, yeah, that, that's a, a funny one, actually. Uh, I remember when it was like uh, they tried doing a cat bylaw, and it, it just, it was so much extra work for the bylaw officers to handle, and it ended up costing the taxpayers more money, and, and it was just something that, you know, people didn't want their money spent on chasing around cats, you know, uh, or, or SPCA. Uh, I, I see our SPCA in there constantly. Uh, I hear all the time that they're overrun or over capacity. Uh, fun, funny actually, uh, my cat got out of my yard one time and I had bylaw show up at my house uh, handing me a fine for it and, uh, yeah. and I just couldn't believe it. And then their motto is uh, speaking uh, for the animals. Well, what cat wants to be left inside all the time? <laughs> Yeah. I, I just want to make a note here. If anyone saw the Fort St. John debate last night, this is where this is one of the topics that went right off the rails. Uh, this one uh, in, in, uh, in, in city chicken coops. Uh, but uh, Dan, you have one question again? Yeah, absolutely. I honestly, uh, the feral cat problem that we had in our community was very significant. Council took the initiative to enhance and build a cat bylaw. We, uh, as a result of that cat bylaw, um, received fifty thousand dollars from PetSmart who gave us $50,000 for a spay and neuter program for all of the cats that were in the city of Dawson Creek, who people that wanted to have them spay and neutered for free. It turned the number of uh, stray cats that were turned into the SPCA, because now they're licensed, now they're identified. It turned the number of them from last year from 40 or 50% of them being unidentified down to about 14% of them. And the number of spay and neutered cats now in our community and the uh, abandoned cat population and the feral cat population is completely diminished. And we were identified and recognized this year as the humane city of uh, British Columbia for yeah. the initiative and the uh, results of our cat bylaw. And so I'm very proud of that. So I'm here on behalf of, uh, I have a civics class at the local high school here, and I, as part of the process, I delivered a copy to my student, but I said, what would you like to ask the local candidate? And so I had my students come together and said, give me one question that I would be able to ask at this time, I'm not sure how much time I would have. So this is the question that my, the youth in my uh, class came up with, and I will talk a little bit about some of the concerns. Um, 
and it's probably a lead to this question, they were concerned and said, and this is their, this is teenagers, 15 to 17, saying there's nothing to do in Dawson Creek. They were very concerned about being active, um, not just talking about businesses, but other things as such. So this is the question that they came up with uh, in the process, so I'll speak to them. Um, what would your plan to be to update the infrastructure for youth activities and aid youth in sports both financially and in improved services? Dale? So, uh, let me give you a little bit of, a, of an overview of uh, the financial uh, implications of what we do today. In the city of Dawson Creek today, out of a 65 or $70 million budget, we collect $17.5 million in property taxation. That's all that comes to our budget for the overall cost of it. Out of that 17 and a half million, if I can use that analogy, 10 million of it is going to arts, culture, and recreation. And so for a community of 13,000 people, we have an amazing aquatic center, we have three arenas, we have the uh, riding arena, we have the, uh, this uh, facility with dance. We have amazing facilities in our community and the capacity for us to add to that continue to build in terms of the financial uh, burden that the city has. And so for us, it's always about trying to sustain services, trying to continue to provide the services we do today. That's the goal, that's the objective. Whatever you're providing today, you want to be providing in 20 or 30 years. And certainly we appreciate that from the view of uh, kids in the community today. But from the city's perspective, to add additional services, it's just, it just adds the labor, it adds costs, and then pretty soon the affordability metric for our residents, our seniors, are pretty soon priced out of being able to afford uh, to be able to live in their own home. And so for me, it's about sustaining and continuing to deliver the stuff we do, and we have amazing facilities in this community. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'd happen to uh, kind of agree with uh, Dale on this one. Uh, you know, you want to sustain what you currently have, uh, and I'd like to see that continue to be sustained. I'd like to see the, the regular upkeep of these uh, buildings into the future. And uh, another thing I'd really like is to see Rotary Lake open again, whether it's a pool or a lake or what have it. And, uh, and yeah, and you know, like, like uh, Dale said, there, you really just got to sustain and everything you add costs more and more money and uh, just raises taxes for everyone. Another uh, writing question here. Uh, what politician and political party do you admire the most and why? Trevor, you pick that one. Start it up. Uh, I can't say political party because I feel like it changes uh, every year based on the candidates for it. Uh, but uh, the a political figure uh, most recently who, uh, who I really recognize uh, would be um, oh uh, Jack Layton with the federal uh, NDP when he ran there. Um, he, he had some really uh, bright ideas and uh, I really liked his vision for the country and I looked at him when I watched the debates on him and I said if anybody can make some good changes for this country it'll be this guy. And uh, it was uh, unfortunate that he passed away and uh, but he was one of my uh, key people I looked up to. Thank you. Dale, same question. Uh, are there any, uh, you know, uh, well, political parties or politicians, any former mayors? May they, might they be in this room? Yeah, none of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here's what I've learned over the last five years. The role of the mayor and the role of council as we serve our community is to build community. And so you work with whoever is the government. And to me, uh, when I start to pick and choose who I think are a good party or a not good party, my role as the mayor is to ensure I do the best job I can for the city of Dawson Creek. And that's working with the Socred government, the NDP government, the Liberal government, the whoever, the whoever the government is, our role is to build a relationship with them and ensure that we leverage and build on that relationship for the benefit of our community to build it. And so I'm not picking winners or losers in any Federal party, provincial party, my role as the mayor is to work with whoever's in party to ensure that we leverage the benefits of the social programs they offer and to support help build our community. Hello. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, what's Dawson Creek doing to address climate change? Or uh, do we have a carbon-friendly uh, initiative set up? So as part of our uh, official community plan, 
Um, the sustainability of our community is one of those key objectives. And so that uh, official community plan is a visionary document. It's a visionary statement for us in terms of what we do and how we move forward. We at the City of Dawson Creek have an energy manager, a, a full-time employee that works on building sustainability and energy efficiencies and reducing our carbon footprint as a community. So we're, we're known as Dawson Creek's first sustainable city, that wind park that sits up on top of our horizon. Um, we were uh, leaders in terms of some of the initiatives we took in, term of, in terms of renewables. And so for me, it's the, the uh, curbside recycling, the recycling initiative. All of those things are uh, uh, built in terms of trying to drive us into a model of being a more sustainable community. And absolutely, as part of our official community, community plan, right. that is one of the vision uh, statements in it. Thanks for that. Good. Thoughts on the uh, DC footprint, carbon footprint? Uh, you know, uh, like I was saying with some stuff earlier, things could always uh, be improved upon. Uh, things could also always have uh, negative effects. I, I think uh, Dale, he's done a pretty good job of uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, da the balancing Dawson Creek's economy with their environment uh, to the best of his ability. And uh, uh, there was actually something interesting I was researching the other day, just uh, uh, based on the environment, and it was a, a carbon recycling plant uh, based out of Squamish. And this plant can make fuel from uh, anywhere. It can make jet fuel, and what it does, it recycles the carbon out of the air and then gets remade in the fuel, and so all that fuel, there's no emissions. And so that's open to the public now, so I'd, I'd really like to look into bringing something like that in the DOS and, uh, and strengthen our environment and create more jobs. Thanks. Um, I'm going to take a step back uh, to the youth question about the facilities you have for youth to do here at Austin Creek. Um, there's a lot of low-income youth that end up turning to drugs and crime because that's a lot easier for them to get their hands on than activities at the arena or here. Um, do you have any future ideas for low-income youth activities? Um, always through our community services area, um, through uh, our, the old parks and recreation area, they're continually developing and dealing with and developing initiatives and issues and programs to help provide uh, opportunities at the pool, the Toonie swims or the Toonie skates or fun in the park where they've got all kinds of activities and initiatives that they've developed in order to try to accommodate those uh, activities that could be low-income, uh, low-cost uh, activities, leveraging our facilities and our uh, uh, amenities within the community. And it is, a, it's a constant ongoing program within community services that we have as a community is to ensure that we try to maximize the value of those amenities and those activities and those programs. And um, as I say, they've got... Um, uh, you go to the community services uh, area and they've got uh, a whole uh, array of activities that you can take and rent out for, take for the day for free to use and have games in the park. And so it's all those things that we try to build and try to continually build initiatives in our community, leveraging and maximizing the infrastructure. Uh, yeah, you know, um, with... Did I turn it off again? Am I still on? I don't think so. Trade it. Trade it. All right. Yeah, one of, one of the things that uh, I, I'd like to see are uh, uh, more uh, public, non-costly public events that people could attend to. And one that I was thinking of uh, recently, I actually had uh, uh, somebody from a minority group approach me and say uh, that they had moved here as a nurse and they had felt like they had been uh, bullied out of town from other minority groups that just didn't understand their culture. And so one of the things that I'd like to see brought to Dawson is a multicultural event. You know, you could use a, a building like K-Pack here, and uh, it could be like a potluck, so everybody brings something in. Now you aren't paying for catering or food, and anybody in the public could attend and learn about different cultures in their community. And uh, I think that'd be a really great uh, start to get youths involved, not only in attending events, but to learn as well. Great. So, 
we are your constituents. How do you plan, or how do you, or how do you plan on engaging with your constituents to find out what it is that your constituents want? This one? Yeah. Yep. So one of the things that I really tried to be very proactive about, um, because I think communication is such an important aspect for us in public life. And so any way that you can find a way to engage with people and give them the opportunity to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, what activities you're engaged in. And so I've developed a very strong Facebook uh, profile. Uh, I've used that as a method to communicate to the residents. I've been very deliberate about it. I keep it very active. I, I post on a regular basis. I try to be transparent about what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, and I feel like I've got now a very strong following. I've developed that. I think there's 21 or 2200 people following that post. And that's one area for me that I think has been a way that I've been able to engage with the community, let them know what we're doing, why we're doing it, we post regular information on what we're doing. I post in February, March, I post all of my uh, travel uh, expenses in the pre previous year so people know what I did, why I did it, I'm spending your money. And so to me, that's a way that I've used to try to engage our community. Right on. Trent, how do you uh, keep in uh, contact with constituents? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a couple things that I, I'd like to uh, see changed. Is um, the number one thing, uh, I haven't been able to attend any city council meetings as they're at uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. And I work at a town a lot, so I'd have to take a full day off of work to attend. Sure, I could watch it on uh, the city's website, but, or I could write the city a letter or message they all on Facebook, but uh, that doesn't really give me a direct uh, input right away, you know. If I want to go to a city council meeting, it's because I have an idea and I want to get my say out, or I want to hear about someone else's idea that they think is going to make a, a big change to the community. Uh, for bigger uh, infrastructure projects, I, I think the, the big thing would just to be, you know, getting out and going to people and telling them this is what we want to see, this is my vision, what do you feel on it, right? And, uh, you know, uh, with uh, the marijuana legalization, they have public input on that and everything, but I didn't have anybody show up and say, oh, how do you feel about this? I didn't even have a survey I could find or anything like that. So I'd like to uh, right try and use every advantage to get to the community. We're approaching that time. Can I just add? Yeah, you got time. Just uh, quickly, if you've got questions, put the hand up because we're going to be around pretty quick. So this might be the last one. Let's see some hands. On the, on the yeah, marijuana yeah. issue, and uh, Trent talked about the survey, we had 850 responses to the survey that the city sent out to people in the community on the marijuana bylaw and the zoning stuff. We have two or three public information sessions at night. So one of the frustrations I think all of us in public life have had, and certainly I've had, is the difficulty in getting people to engage. We do public meetings and every year in the spring when we're doing our budget cycle, we'd have three and four public meetings to engage the community in terms of what, the, what our budget was doing, what our capital budget was doing, what our five year capital plan was doing. We would have three or four of them. We would have staff spend three and four and five days preparing for that one meeting, we would have six people show up or eight people show up. We would have more people showing up and our yeah. staff and things than what we, and so it's very difficult. If anybody's got the magic answer in terms of how to engage people to come at night, I'd love to hear it because we've tried everything in terms of trying to engage people. The best uh, have been in terms of uh, some of those where there's specific initiatives or specific issues and then that brings them out. But it's been really difficult to engage people in uh, to come to meetings at night. Okay. My name is Linda Wingfield and I'm from the Philippines. However, I was not bullied when I came to Dawson Creek. As a matter of fact, I was welcomed. To top what, what I'm going to say is that <clears throat> When it comes to the marijuana problem, even our federal government doesn't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> the city is providing whatever they need to provide. And that's what it is. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> However, I am really thankful. I came in this country in 1972, and I was 100 pounds. <laughs> However, I am very, very grateful for the city 
the mayor, and the councillors. They tried their very best. They addressed everything here. Bullying, marijuana, cat, <laughs> everything. But this is what I'm going to say to everybody. We have a beautiful city. I travel half the world. I shake Benjamin Netanyahu's name. If you don't know him, he's the Prime Minister of Israel. And I was still alive. <laughs> One thing I know is this. There is a lot of what we call transparency. Transparency without accountability is pointless as far as I'm concerned. The children of our school address it, right? But I will tell you this, and I'm not rooting for anybody. This is a free country. I can vote for you, but I'll tell you this. We have to have representation. Wherever we go, we have to be represented by the people of this city. And that's the mayor there, Bumstead. We do need clock. So I'd like to hear four questions. Uh, we're going to get into the outros here, uh, although I think Dale just had this. Um, okay, Dale, we have a question? Okay. Okay. You want to read it if you have? No, I. I just have a question about this garbage recycling that we have in town. Is it, uh, what you call that, mandatory to have it yes. all? Yes. Is recycling mandatory? Yes. yes. And it's costing us people here. How much does it cost? Six dollars and eighty cents a month. Yeah, that's another infrastructure added to our water bill, right? Yes. Oh dear. There we go. That kind of makes up for that. I'll put the mic down. That makes up for the pulpit that you just had over there. Right. <laughs> I was, I was going to be happy to answer, but I'm, I'm whatever. No, you, like. you get it on the outro here, you're getting about three minutes. So. Uh, no, uh, just a few announcements before we're going to get exactly that, Chen. You're going to have four minutes to uh, say uh, goodbye to everybody. And so is Dale then. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dale can address some things that were, and you both can, uh, that were missed or you want to pick up now. A few announcements is uh, advanced polls, October 10th and 17th. Uh, the special note about the October 10th polls is they're going to be in this building but not in here. They're going to be upstairs because I believe this one's booked already. Uh, on other programming notes, we've got uh, councillor debates. So if you like this, this is not going to be the set for the councillor debate in a couple weeks heading or a week uh, in Canada, so check us out there. Uh, otherwise, Trenton, you've got four minutes. This is the last chance. We're still Facebook Live. <laughs> yeah, uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody who, uh, who attended tonight, who's watching on Facebook, and uh, I don't know if it's on the radio, but whoever is listening on the radio for uh, taking the, the time to come and listening to both me and Dale's vision, you know, I, I think uh, Dale, I think he's done a pretty good job over the years, and I just think uh, I could improve upon and, uh, where he left off from. And, uh, you know, I'm just really passionate about my community, and I just really want to see my vision become uh, a reality, and I, I hope that uh, I could hear all your ideas and still continuing to come, and that uh, we could find a solution to everyone's problems in this town. Uh, and that's, that's really my goal, is just I just want the people to have a voice again, and I think that's the, the main reason why I'm running, is so people could have a say and come to these events, and say and share their thoughts, and so they could hear our, what we think about uh, your guys' thoughts and everything. And so uh, thank you all for coming. Bill. Thank you. Um, so for me, uh, this is uh, the end of the... Uh, first uh, full cycle as the mayor. Um, I honestly, uh, being uh, the mayor in your hometown where you're born and raised and your family's resided for 60 or 70 years, and you've uh, given uh, as much as you can through your entire adult life to help build a community and volunteer and be part of a community. Um, these last five years have been very special for me in terms of being able to take on the role of the mayor. Um, I, I honestly, you're not good about kind of uh, blowing your own horn when it comes to these types of things. I've tried to work uh, diligently and uh, taken the accountability of the mayor uh, very seriously. Uh, the role of the mayor is a full-time job to me. 
uh, I'm, at, I'm at the office uh, almost without exception every day. And then anytime I get asked to go to things at night or the weekends, uh, I have a hard time saying no because I think that's part of the accountability of the mayor. Uh, and people want you to be part of that. They want you to be part of your community. And I think I've given uh, as much as possible in the five years that I've been the mayor. And uh, I think that I've demonstrated that commitment to the community. And it's not just at a high level. It's when I get those calls when people talk about, are you listening? Um, when people phone me or they send me a message, uh, I answer them. I answer them uh, individually. And if somebody asks me a question and asks me to follow it up, I follow it up. Um, there are very few times um, that I don't and haven't made that commitment to somebody that I'll follow something up that I don't follow it up. And I think that's the accountability and responsibility we have in a leadership role in our community. It's not just the governance, it's not just the policy, it's not just running the city council meetings, it's not just setting the agenda, it's not just acting as a CEO, as the intermediary between your council and your staff. It's about all those things in your community that take place where people feel like you're listening. There's that old saying that people have, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And to me, that's been my life. And um, this is my community, I'm born and raised here, um, I'm going to stay here for the rest of my life. Um, and nobody who is, has, is, doesn't have that uh, personal uh, scenario of this is your home, this is your life. My dad's buried out here. This is my home. Thank you. So that's all, that's all we've got for you tonight. Uh, thanks for coming out uh, live and for everybody on Facebook. And uh, exactly that, Dale said it before, democracy and helping keep Dawson Creek great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time up here. Thanks, Rob.